Hello, my friends. Welcome to the last of our midweek Wednesday Lenten services. We have been tracing the places of the Passion throughout these weeks, and tonight we find ourselves at Jesus' trial, the place of his identity. If you're watching our video on our website, then you've already found the bulletin right next to the video. But if you're watching on YouTube and you'd like to see the bulletin uh, to follow along in that way, then you can find that at kingofgracelutheran.com, and then click on Sermons on the home page, and you'll be able to find this service and the bulletin there. Otherwise, the words for the hymns will be on the screen for you, and you can uh, participate and join in our service that way. We'll sing hymn number 292, if you have a hymnary. That's O Dearest Jesus. We'll sing verses 1, 5. Turn to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in mercy, and he relents from sending disaster. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray for God's mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you desire to be merciful, and are always more willing to pardon than condemn. Listen to the prayers of your penitent people, and in your goodness, set free all who are trapped in sin. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Passion reading continues today with Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, the 27th chapter, uh, beginning with the 45th verse. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, This fellow is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran, took a sponge, and soaked it with sour wine. Then he put it on a stick and gave him a drink. The rest said, Leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. After Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Suddenly the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. Tombs were opened and many bodies of saints who had fallen asleep were raised to life. Those who came out of the tombs went into the holy city after Jesus' resurrection and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were guarding Jesus with him saw the earthquake 
and the things that had happened, they were terrified and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Many women who had followed Jesus from Galilee and who had served him there, uh, who had served him, were there, watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and then Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and laid it in his own new tomb that he had cut in the rock. He rolled a large stone over the tomb's entrance and left. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. On the next day, which was the day after the preparation day, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered in the presence of Pilate, and they said, Sir, we remembered what that deceiver said when he was still alive. After three days, I will rise again. So give a command that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples might steal his body and tell the people he is risen from the dead. And this last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go, make it as secure as you know how. And so they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and posting a guard. This is our passion reading. We'll sing hymn number 282, if you have a hymnary. Alas, and did my Savior bleed? Verses 1, 5, and 6. of our Wednesday Lenten services, and it finds us at the trial of Jesus. Now, the portion of Luke's gospel that we're going to read today includes two scenes, one in the Sanhedrin and one before Pontius Pilate. And Luke has set up these scenes to be parallel to each other. In both cases, somebody asks about Jesus' identity, and he gives them an answer. But their responses are very different. And by framing the story in this way, St. Luke makes it clear that there's only one reason why Jesus was killed. We hear from Luke chapter 22, beginning with verse 66. As soon as it was day, the council of the elders of the people met together, both the chief priests and experts in the law. They brought him into their Sanhedrin and said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But Jesus said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer me or release me. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. They all said, Are you then the Son of God? He said to them, I am 
what you are saying. Then they said, why do we need any more testimony? For we ourselves have heard it from his own mouth. The whole group of them got up and brought him before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow misleading our nation, forbidding the payment of taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? It is as you say, Jesus replied. Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for a charge against this man. We pray. These are your words. Heavenly Father, sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Both of the scenes that we just read are about Jesus' identity. The Jews asked, are you the Son of God? And Jesus answered by saying, You are saying, I am. That was enough for them to determine that he was guilty and deserved death. In the second scene, Pilate also asked a question of identity. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered the same way. You are saying. But Pilate's response is very different from the Jews. He said, I find no basis for a charge against this man. The parallels in the story make those differences at the end stand out. And that's what Luke wants us to see. Now, Pilate should probably have been worried about a rival king. Just think about Herod the Great, 30 years earlier when Jesus was born. Wise men came from the east. They said, tell us where the king of the Jews has been born. And Herod was so worried about a future potential rival to his throne that he was willing to order that all the sons of Bethlehem be killed. You'd think that Pilate would react that same way. But he wasn't worried, and he, he declared Jesus to be not guilty. And we may wonder, why did Pilate respond that way? We can speculate either that Pilate thought the claim was totally ridiculous, and just dismissed it out of hand. I mean, here's a guy without anybody following him, what doesn't appear to have any nation or army behind him, certainly not a credible rival to Pilate himself or to Caesar in Rome. Pilate could simply have dismissed the claim as, claim as ridiculous, or he could have believed that Jesus was telling the truth. He may simply have thought lying doesn't deserve the death penalty. But the reasons for Pilate's response are not given us in the text, and therefore they can't be the point. We are told what we need to know. The point is that Jesus' claim to be Messiah, his claim to be King of the Jews, is not what got him killed. This isn't a political crucifixion. Jesus was killed for his claim to be the Son of God. And everything hangs on whether or not that claim is true. Now, it's a common complaint that young postmodern brains today don't acknowledge such a thing as universal truth. What may be true for you isn't necessarily true for me. Now, that can't always work in things like gravity. That's the case for everybody. Things like uh, societies uh, would be unable to function if pathological lying were a good thing. There are certain things that are universally true for all human beings. But to complain that relative truth is a postmodern problem or a young generational problem is to mischaracterize what's happening. After all, 2,000 years ago, Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? I'm sure you've been watching the news media over the last few weeks, and it's older generations of Americans, doctors and scientists and politicians, who are arguing about truth, each claiming a fact and then claiming to tell you the correct interpretation, the correct behavior, the correct response 
to that fact, and they can't agree with each other. It's becoming almost impossible to know where to turn, whom to trust. Where can you go these days to find truth? Now, our media has become a form of a courtroom where some of the evidence, but usually not all, is presented, and then both sides condemn each other for not arriving at a predetermined outcome. They pay attention only to the evidence that supports where they want to go, and then they reject all the evidence that may provide a different point of view. That's not a generational problem. That's something that all human beings struggle with. And it's the same scene that we find 2,000 years ago. Jesus also was standing in a makeshift courtroom, and its jury had already determined the outcome. They were merely looking for reasons to get there. They began by asking Jesus if he were the Christ. Now, that's the Greek form of the Hebrew word Messiah, the anointed one. Now, there isn't any tone of voice in the writing, of course, but I imagine that Jesus had to have been a little exasperated when he replied. If I tell you, you will not believe. I mean, after all. The truth that Jesus is the Messiah has already been proclaimed, already been demonstrated for three years of his ministry. They haven't believed already because they don't want to admit it. And so there's really no use in saying it again. And then Jesus went on to say, If I ask you, you will not answer. Even their own question couldn't be answered in a way that they would like. You see, if they were to say, no, Jesus was not the Messiah, they would alienate all the people they're trying to lead, all the people who only a few days earlier had welcomed Jesus riding into Jerusalem as the king on Palm Sunday. The people were loving Jesus. If they said, no, he's not the Messiah, then their claim of Jesus as a revolutionary, which is what they hope will sway Pilate, goes out the window. If, on the other hand, they were to say, yes, Jesus is the Messiah, then, of course, they would have to let him go right then and submit to him. And so they're stuck without an answer. Now, there is a clear answer before them, but they don't like where it leads. They don't like the outcome that they've already determined they want. And that may still be the case even today for someone listening right now. Do you think that Jesus is the Messiah? If you say yes, then you'll have to submit to his teaching and to his way of life. If you say no, then you're only left with a human being who was a great moral teacher. That choice is about to disappear in the next verse. Jesus went beyond their question about being the Messiah. And he said, From now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Now, the Son of Man is a mysterious figure from a vision that Daniel had in chapter 7 of his The Son of Man is a human figure who was led into the presence of God the Father. He was given authority and dominion over all of creation. And then, all people and nations worshipped him. Something that clearly is reserved for God. This Son of Man from Daniel's vision has to be more than merely human. And the Jews understood perfectly well what Jesus was claiming. They said, are you then the Son of God? You can debate if what Jesus claimed was true, if he really was the Son of God or not. But you cannot debate what he meant, what he intended. It's clear that Jesus meant to claim to be God and that the Jews understood what he meant. If he's not God, as he claimed, then Jesus of Nazareth is a pathological liar. 
and pathological liars can't be great moral teachers. You can either accept Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of creation, or you can reject him as a lunatic. But there's nothing in the middle. For the Jews, this claim to be divine and to properly be worshipped as God was blasphemy. Something that the Old Testament law said was punishable by death. If Jesus was falsely claiming to be God, then what the Jews were about to do was completely appropriate. They should kill him. That's what the law says. It depends on whether or not Jesus is telling the truth. Now, in a courtroom like this supposedly was, the preponderance of evidence would indicate Jesus is telling the truth. There are no character witnesses that can ever say Jesus lied. The Jews themselves never make the accusation about any other claim that Jesus was lying. The character of Jesus is of truth. The prophet Isaiah said of the Messiah, no deceit was found in his mouth. But the Jews had made their decision. Jesus wasn't going to be killed because he claimed to be the Messiah, because he claimed to be a king, but because he claimed to be God. They weren't interested in whether that claim was true or not. But under Roman rule, the Jews had no authority to carry out the death penalty, so they had to go to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, and convince him to kill Jesus. Now the problem, of course, is that the Roman governor isn't interested in the claim of somebody to be the Son of God. He doesn't care. He doesn't believe in this Jewish God anyway. And so the Jews have to invent some other charges, and they come up with three. We found this fellow misleading our nation, forbidding the payment of taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Now, Luke doesn't record that Pilate even paid any attention to the first two charges at all. Even if Pilate knew that Jesus had actually encouraged the Jews to pay their taxes, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, he may have simply shrugged and said, who doesn't oppose paying taxes? And what do I care about a Jewish man nonviolently misleading some people's thoughts? These aren't credible threats. To the Roman Empire, they certainly don't deserve the death penalty. What Luke does record is that Pilate clarified the question of Jesus' identity. Are you the king of the Jews? And then he declared Jesus was not guilty on that charge. The crucifixion of Jesus was not political. It was only because he claimed to be the Son of God. Now, there's lots of truth flying around these days, and it can be hard to know who to trust. But here is a trustworthy statement that deserves full acceptance. Jesus is the Son of God. And because he is the infinite God, his payment for sin has an infinite value. That can pay for your sin. That can pay for mine. Because he is the infinite God, his resurrection from the dead has an infinite value, an infinite power to raise each of us from the dead, too. Now, these questions at Jesus' trial were about his identity, but let's close by thinking about our identity. By his divine nature, Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, but by his human nature... His genealogy can be traced back to Adam. And that's how Luke records Jesus' genealogy in the third chapter. He wrote it this way. Jesus was the son of Joseph, the son of Eli, the son of Mathat. Then he went on. He was the son of David, the son of Jesse. He was the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, he was the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. 
You see, Jesus' humanity also makes him a son of God. And you are also human, which means that this genealogy is also part of your genealogy. That's how far back you go. All human beings from the beginning were meant to be the sons and daughters of God, meant to be rulers in his image, kings and queens of creation under God our Father. Now we have lost that status because of our turning away. But through our baptismal participation in Jesus' death and resurrection, we have been restored to our original position as children of God. So there was only one reason that Jesus was killed, because he was the Son of God. For us, there is only one reason that we should live eternally. Because Jesus has made us sons and daughters of God. That truth of our identity does not shift and change with the world around us. Rejoice, for you are one of God's chosen children. You have eternal life as part of God's family. Have confidence, my friends. God's word is truth. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We sing hymn number 597, if you have a hymnary. Savior, again to thy dear name we raise. We'll sing verses 1 and 2. join me to pray. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. Please forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I entrust myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. We join in our Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. Amen. 
Thanks for joining us this week for our midweek Lenten service. Our Sunday morning Palm Sunday service will be available that morning, and we look forward to celebrating the arrival of our King uh, on that day coming up. If you have um, watched our service on our website, you've also seen the link for giving. Of course, the ministry at King of Grace goes on even during these difficult times. Um, it's uh, impossible to pass the offering plate here in church, and so you may find uh, options for supporting our ministry there on our website. Also this week, please watch for an email uh, for a voters meeting. We'll have an online voters meeting to discuss some of our financial situation. That email uh, will come sometime on Thursday for our uh, voters meeting at 7 o'clock Thursday night. Lord's blessings to you.